Are you old enough to remember the emotional story about Iraqi soldiers stealing babies from incubators in a Kuwaiti hospital back in 1991? A Kuwaiti teenager introduces Nayira, said she had seen Iraqi soldiers take 312 infants out of their incubators and put them on the cold floor to die. Well, this story made headlines around the world and was repeated by political leaders, especially by U.S. President George H.W. Bush, who wanted to go to war against Iraq. Or perhaps you may remember the weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, that Iraq allegedly had. In February 2003, then U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell addressing the United Nations claimed that Saddam Hussein was producing weapons of mass destruction. What we are giving you are facts and conclusions based on solid intelligence, Powell told the Security Council. And his address helped to win over the UN to wage war on Iraq in 2003. There's just one major problem with each of these stories, and that neither was true. But nevertheless, being false didn't stop these claims from causing havoc and destroying the lives of millions of people. Well, these are examples of what some may call an art, the art of propaganda. On this program, we will look at how propaganda was fine-tuned during World War I and why that matters to us today. Hello and welcome to Hidden Files. I'm Marzia Hashimi. Over 100 years ago, in 1914, World War I broke out in Europe. Now, the Americans had declared neutrality, which was supported by both the president uh, and the people. Edward Bernays was a nephew of Sigmund Freud, and he used his uncle's expertise in psychology with his own journalism background to create a way to make the unlikable more appealing. For example, when the American political elite had a change of heart and decided that the United States had to enter the war, they needed to figure out a way to convince a reluctant public of the need to get involved in that European war. Thus, the Committee on Public Information was formed, and its job was to change public opinion via mass persuasion. It was led by George Creel, and Bernays was a part of the group. There was a massive campaign of speeches, films, posters, etc., and it was extremely successful. CPI became the largest propaganda machine the world had ever seen up to that point, and its selling point was targeting the emotions of Americans without consideration of logic or even truth. Take a look. It was a plain publicity proposition, Creel recalled, a vast enterprise in salesmanship. Creel was a pioneer, you might say, in the field of public relations. And then Wilson appoints him the head of something called the Committee on Public Information, which, not to put too fine a point on it, is essentially the U.S. government's agency for propaganda. Creel saw his problem as transforming the American people into one white-hot mass of enthusiasm for the war. And the CPI went from a bureaucracy of one person to an army of about 100,000 people in the space of a couple of months. The CPI mobilized movie stars for the Liberty Loan message. Mary Pickford, Charlie Chaplin, all of the greatest stars of their day. Celebrity culture is just starting to emerge and they can turn out crowds, and those crowds then become some of the biggest uh, rallies that you see on the home front during the war. Creel even found a way to push his message when the movie screens were dark. In between every reel of film, there was a four-minute break when the projectionist had to change the reels. Someone at the CPI hit on the idea that this was a perfectly captive audience for the delivery of the war message. Prominent members of the local community would stand up and deliver short patriotic speeches. They became known as the Four Minute Men. And what began in movie theaters quickly spread to any venue where an audience assembled. In New York, 
Creel's volunteer army addressed half a million people each week. Ten men gave talks in Yiddish, seven in Italian. President Wilson himself gave a four-minute speech. These four-minute men would give a talk on some aspect of Americanism, why we are fighting, what are the principles we're fighting for. The appearance of spontaneity masked a carefully scripted government message. These were no haphazard talks by nondescripts, Creel insisted, but the careful, studied, and rehearsed efforts of the best men in each community. Each speech aimed as a rifle is aimed, and driving to its mark with the precision of a bullet. They were guided by a central authority, but always in the own words of the individual giving the speech. And he was usually a person who was known in the community. He was not saying, this is what the government says. He was saying, I'm an intelligent person, successful person. This is what I think. You should think this way too. So propaganda, or as it became known as, public relations was such a success during that war that afterwards it became a permanent fixture of American society and other places to sell anything from products that people may not need or not have the money for to wars that people had no interest in being a part of. Well, that was the roots of modern propaganda, but it has been fine-tuned with great sophistication and effect and has led to the current world of television and modern media, much has been invested in trying to direct the human psyche and nothing has been more effective than mass media where it can demonize those seen as the enemy or immortalize those seen as friends. Well, to help me take a closer look at all of this, I'd like to welcome my guests to the program. Dr. Tim Anderson is director of the Sydney-based Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies. He worked as a lecturer and senior lecturer at Australian universities for more than 30 years, teaching, researching, and publishing on human rights in development, customary land in Melanesia, small farming and food security, health systems and infectious disease, Cuban medical internationalism, self-determination and development, independent regional integration, and resistance to the wars of the 21st century. His most recent books are Land and Livelihoods in Papua New Guinea, 2015, The Dirty War on Syria, 2016, now published in 10 languages, Countering War on Propaganda of the Dirty War on Syria, 2017, Axis of Resistance Towards an Independent Middle East, 2019, and The Pandemic and the Independent Countries, 2020. Oh, welcome to the program, Tim. I, I want to look at the concept of propaganda. I mean, the way it was used in the past and also if we look at uh, how it's used today. We're looking at uh, virtually a century of propaganda used in society generally, but in particular in relation to war, as you mentioned, the First World War and where Bernays' ideas were uh, developed, I suppose. And there was a great effort to try and uh, persuade the US public back then, uh, 100 years ago, to get involved in what was essentially a, a European war between a reconfiguration of power between the old empires. Uh, and that, that had a, a role uh, in, also in empowering the, the US voice and the US, including the US Zionist voice in British politics of the time, which of course became important because the British and the French were the colonial powers that took over the old Ottoman Empire and started to carve up the Levant and particularly, of course, Palestine. And, uh, you know, the Balfour Declaration was part of that. So the, the role of the US Zionists in that propaganda a century ago is an important one to remember. Now, if we look at the type of propaganda today, I believe it's far more sophisticated. I think that they are dealing with um, more highly educated populations. Um, the systematic character of the propaganda and the messages, as Bernays said, emotional messages, more important than actual the actual facts. You know, for example, we look at a particular incident becomes much less important than the overall messaging that's going on uh, around that around that particular incident. Uh, and that's very important today, I believe, in, in hybrid wars that are largely led by the liberal side of US imperialism, 
which likes to have proxy wars, it likes to have propaganda wars, economic wars, and so-called smart power, which is about getting other people to fight their wars and other people to finance their wars. I mean, propaganda may not be based on truth. I want to look at uh, how dangerous that is for us, especially today. I said it, uh, populations are more educated these days, um, not necessarily that they're more intelligent, but uh, in, in some ways, uh, very simple people with strong values sometimes understand these issues better than more highly educated populations. That's the sad reality. And those of us in Western cultures or, or English speaking cultures, let's say, have to deal with as, as a huge challenge. Why is it that people swallow the weapons of mass destruction, lies, the, you know, the, the Gaddafi feeding Viagra to his troops. They're using that same lie against the Russians at the moment. There are so many recycled fictions that are used to disarm a population and to get rid of the, the opposition uh, to the latest war, the latest proxy war, for example, that it depends on techniques that are, are quite constant. And um, of course, one part of it is the the domination of the media, the control of the social media to a large extent, the insistence, the repeated nature of these uh, lies, like you know the chemical weapons in Syria, repeated for year after year after year until it comes to a point where people can't imagine that there wasn't some truth to this this particular lie. But you've also got, I believe, um, on the part of Western audiences, a predisposition to. Uh, want to believe that they are helping in some way or they are on some human rights crusade when they back the latest economic war or or, or military intervention against the country. It's an extraordinary thing and I think it, it bothers me as an educator in a Western society that we have to really start studying the nature of stupidity in Western populations because it's not all about information. It's also about people's emotional predisposition to believe these sorts of fictions about the, the, the character of war after war after war. I mean, thinking people have to raise some questions, but nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the propaganda machine relies on, it depends upon the fact that there are all these reinforcing messages and those questions don't really reach a very high level. Well, another part of propaganda is demonizing the other and controlling information. For example, on certain platforms right now, we see how Press TV or RT are, are labeled as state-controlled media, but when it comes to VOA or BBC um, that are government-funded, that is not the case. So already from the beginning, when someone looks at these alternative uh, pages or networks, um, they'll be met with uh, negative uh, feelings or perspective. I mean, your take on all of this. They put those tags in, a, in an extremely partisan way. Uh, Voice of America, of course, is completely funded by the US government, but same with the BBC. Um, the, but they claim there's some difference between the BBC and, and Press TV, for example, in, in character. Of course, there isn't. Uh, I mean, there's other important uh, mechanisms which are, you, you will find fairly readily um, through experimentation. The search engines, for example, if you search human rights and Iran, for example, you're going to find a huge number of uh, sources from the US and from Britain and from their embedded NGOs, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and so on. But if it's Iran talking about human rights, you'll have to look very carefully to find that, uh, those references. The same with China. If you want to find China's report on human rights in the US and you search China, human rights US, you will find everything about the US saying human rights in China and you'll look very hard to try and find what China is saying about human rights in the US. So there are a number of mechanisms there that are that are at play to deliberately um, curtail the flow of information to prevent people from accessing a range of information and, and channeling it down to repetition of the same sources. So, I mean, when there are so many controls put in place, what is key in order to discern truth from fiction in this massive world of propaganda? 
I find very encouraging the fact that there are good media collaborations between Latin America and West Asia. And one of the examples is Al Maidin, for example, which is largely in Spanish and Arabic and now beginning in, in English. And that's really a collaboration between independent West Asian media and um, independent Latin American media. Then you have Hispan TV, which is a collaboration with the same with independent Latin American media, Iranian, Iranian um, media in Spanish. Um, then we have Telesur itself, which is a continental network in Latin America, which is still a very powerful and universal source of information in Latin America. So um, the Russians also have some collaborations, um, the Chinese to a, a more limited extent now, but at least we're seeing with the division of the world into big blocks that you can go to uh, large media organizations in China, in India, for example, if you want to get some independent sources of information about what's happening in Ukraine, for example. But the domination of the Anglo-Americans of, of media sources is something that's been there for a long time and it's developed a great capacity and it's a huge um, advantage that the Anglo-Americans have in the world of propaganda. Well, I appreciate your insight into all of this. Thanks so much uh, for being with us right here on Hidden Files. Well, remember I mentioned the Kuwaiti girl at the top of the show who talked about what she had witnessed. Let's take a look at that. Thank you very much. Our final witness is also using an assumed name. And again, we ask uh, our friends in the media to respect the need to, for her to protect her family. And we finally call on Naira to testify. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Naira, and I just came out of Kuwait. My mother and I were in Kuwait on August 2nd for a peaceful summer holiday. My older sister had a baby on July 29th, and we wanted to spend some time in Kuwait with her. I only pray that none of my 10th grade classmates had a summer vacation like I did. I may have wished sometime that I could be an adult. That I could grow up quickly. What I saw happen to the children of Kuwait and to my country has changed my life forever. It has changed the life of all Kuwaitis, young and old. We are children no more. My sister with my five-day-old nephew, traveled across the desert to safety. There was no milk available for the baby in Kuwait. They barely escaped when their car was stuck in the desert, desert sand, and help came from Saudi Arabia. I stayed behind and wanted to do something for my country. The second week after an invasion, I volunteered, volunteered at the Aladan Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. That was horrifying. Well, just remember, no matter how emotional that appeal was, everything she said was a lie. Nayeda was actually the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United States. Her fake testimony played a role in the killing of one and a half million Iraqis dying from starvation due to U.S. sanctions and tens of thousands of Iraqis dying during the U.S. 1990s war desert storm. But no one. No one ever held Nayira, nor did they hold the United States accountable for this falsehood. Millions of Iraqis lost lives and millions of disrupted lives were left behind. And a big part of it was all due to a lie. Propaganda can kill if packaged with the right covering. So be careful and stay aware. That brings us to the end of the show. I'm Marzia Hashimi, and I hope you will join myself and all the crew right here next week for Hidden Files.